Why do we all love Tetris so much? One dreary winter day in Soviet Russia, Alexei Pazhitov sat down at his Electronica 60 and began pecking away on the project that would make his name. This was 1984, right in the thick of the Cold War when he was employed at the Dorodichin Computing Center, the same building where the effects of nuclear winter were first modeled. You can imagine his colleague's surprise when they peeked over his shoulder and saw that he had written a computer game. Pazhitov called it Tetris, tetra from the Greek word meaning four since all the pieces were made of four blocks, and is from tennis because reasons. Little did they know that this tiny game would soon become a global sensation. From the Russian Academy of Sciences, Tetris spread on floppy disks throughout Moscow, eventually making its way to the satellite state of Hungary, where it punched through the Iron Curtain and came to the West. 170 million copies later, and the game has become one of the most beloved in history. Tetris has appeared on almost every platform there is, from Facebook to Texas Instrument Calculators. The success, though, is kind of weird when you think about it. Other games of its time, like Super Mario Brothers, were far more advanced. Tetris had no plucky mascots, no plot, no awesome graphics, just blocks. So why did this little game about endlessly tumbling blocks become so huge? The quick answer is because it's easy to get hooked on. To the uninitiated, the object of Tetris is to stack rows of descending blocks as tightly as you can. When you complete a row, it disappears. But if the blocks reach the top, you lose. Simple, right? but it has a powerful effect on the brain. According to this Wired article from the 90s, Tetris supercharges your cerebral glucose metabolic rate, aka GMR, the first time you play. This gives you a geeked up feeling because your brain is burning through energy at a hyperactive speed. Naturally, you want to play it again, but over time you become familiar with the game, so your brain slacks off and does less work and your GMR dips. But then your brain starts craving that original energy rush. This drives you to get better and move on to hard harder levels with faster decision making while your brain becomes more efficient. Tetris trains your brain to stop using inefficient gray matter and amps your decision making abilities to be faster and stronger. So at this point, the game does not let me play as fast as I want. Um, that really comes from level 300 onwards. Tetris is so heady that it causes a mild mind altering phenomenon known as the Tetris effect. That's where people who play for too long will start seeing Tetris patterns on the sides of buildings, in their sleep, or even on our own set. Its mechanics click to our brain like a magnet and pull us deeper and deeper inside until it obsesses us. But what is it about Tetris's game design that keeps us coming back? When things start changing right before your eyes, Tetrisized. Let's start with the basic truth about Tetris. No one has ever beaten it, yet it's one of the most popular games in the world. It's kind of sadistic if you think about it. You lose every single time. Even the world's most amazing Tetris playing AI ultimately fails, though it can clear over 2 million lines. And the reason you will always lose no matter what is because of math. How do I do this? The game's pieces are called tetraminos. There are seven tetraminos in total, and they fit together in intricate geometric patterns like this one, or this one. So it may seem that you could theoretically play Tetris indefinitely, if it stayed on the slowest setting and you didn't have to eat. But if you look closely at the pattern, you see that it's eight tiles wide. However, the Tetris well is 10 tiles wide from side to side, so even if you were dealt the perfect arrangement, it wouldn't quite fit. Over time, Tetris forces you to reckon with those two pet extra vertical rows, which may explain why so many strategies involve filling in the gaps on either side. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad, but things are complicated further by the random number generator, or as Tetris aficionados call it, the bag. In early versions of Tetris, the pieces were distributed at random, so if you got lucky, you could keep playing for a very long time. But as Hank Rogers told us, he's the man who went to Russia to secure the rights for Nintendo to do Tetris on the Game Boy. They introduced the bag in 1990. The bag works by having all seven tetraminos placed in it, shaken up, and dealt out one at a time. After those seven pieces are exhausted, seven more pieces go into the bag and the process repeats. This was done to make the game more equitable. Players would be waiting forever for that eye piece, and it simply wouldn't come. 
We've all been there. But the bag giveth and the bag taketh away. In Tetris, there's a particularly fatal combo of pieces which works to thwart your perfect strategy. It's called the snake sequence, and yes, it's as bad as it sounds. A snake sequence is when you get an S piece and a Z piece back to back. This combination is one of the trickiest in the game. It's like the 7-10 split of Tetris. They're particularly dangerous when you're dealt more than two of them. Usually, the bag works to prevent you from getting too many of these snaky pieces in a row, most of the time. Time, but there's a small chance to be snake bitten when you get a new bag. Sorry. You have a 1 in 257 chance of being dealt three snake pieces in a row from one bag to the next. Say ZSS or SSZ. And if you're particularly unlucky, there's a smaller chance that you'll be dealt four in a row. One in 3087 to be exact. As Heidi Burgel proves in her paper How to Lose a Tetris, this is very bad news. Over the course of a very long time, these fatal combinations will eventually produce gaps that cannot be filled. In other words, you, you lose. lose. Good, Good day, day sir. sir. In fact, a game that's played with only alternating S and Z pieces is doomed to fail in a mere 70,000 turns. And though some very smart people have found a way to feasibly play forever when using some very relaxed features you can enable in some versions of the game, the brilliance of Tetris is how it leads us to believe that we can be perfect, although we never can be. Maybe the real appeal of Tetris is how it speaks to our understanding of important mathematical concepts like probability and geometry and infinite sets, but it does so naturally in a way that we can pick it up and instantly say, I get this. To quote the Russian mathematician George Cantor, the essence of mathematics lies entirely in its freedom. And Tetris lets us grasp how vast that freedom is, if only for a moment, before all those blocks come crashing down on top of us. So what do you think? What makes Tetris so captivating? Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. Oh, and if you want to know a little bit more about Tetris, I have a guest. Hey, I'm Vanessa from Braincraft. And you did an episode about Tetris and... The brain, so about what's going on inside your head when you're playing the game. You should absolutely check it out, and uh, we'll see you next week. Last week, we talked about why video game bodies are so extreme. Let's see what you had to say. Zuto Aragi asks a very reasonable question, what's wrong with idealized bodies? And to that, I would say nothing. We see idealized bodies all over the place. We see them in film, we see them in animation. Um, obviously, fashion is predicated on some type of idealization. The problem is, whose bodies are we idealizing and why? And that's the issue that I'm really drawing here. Um, specifically, that we are taking a, a very male perspective. It's a male-dominated industry. And so the way that we idealize bodies tends to reflect that um, specific viewpoint. So there's nothing wrong with idealization. We just need more scope and more diversity. Tyler Culp and later Bruce Wright, who's actually an effects animator at Disney Animation Studios, uh, pointed out that the quote that I had taken from Lino DeSalvo, who is the, uh, the head of animation for Disney's movie Frozen, was actually taken out of context and that Disney actually issued a statement. Um, from the round table where that quote was taken, Lino was actually talking about the uh, sort of technical, uh, technical challenges around animation, not specifically in gender differences. So I'm sorry about that. And uh, yeah, sorry about that. 82 Jaster says that I'm throwing Dragon's Crown a little bit under the bus because there are other female body types, specifically the Amazon, who's a much larger character, and the elf, who is petite, both are women. Two things I'll say about that. The first is that the idea of the Amazon or Amazonian women is a bit of an outdated concept that has its own specific baggage. I will link to that in the description. And second of all, how these games are marketed is incredibly important. I remember the year that Dragon's Crown came out. I was at E3 and the uh, Dragon's Crown, there was an advertisement for it that was around my badge and who was adorning my name tag, but it was the character with giant breasts. So these things do matter, but I hear what you're saying. So it might be a situation of two steps forward and one step back. Colin Nupel has a little bit of a quibble in terms of how I describe the process of how characters come to be. Um, to be more specific, Colin says the artists decide what a character looks like, designers approve the designs, and animators decide how a character's move. But Colin is saying that animators are typically at the end of the production process. I would say uh, I wasn't trying to lay this all at animators' feet or trying to point specific fin fingers and say that it's always animators' fault. That said, um, if you look at the example from Dragon Age, you can have gender biases in terms of how characters move. Um, 
so you know it's a little bit of a group effort but i do appreciate that distinction mods and n says that i'm forgetting about the importance of silhouettes that silhouettes are what um, game designers and character creators use to communicate um, certain values for example in gears of war um, the motivation for having these giant sort of bulky space marines was that you didn't want to lose track of your character on screen and that pushed the design of those characters in a particular direction there are two things i would say to that the first is that if you looked at a game like team fortress 2 clearly you could have a wide variety of different body types um, and still have really memorable distinctive silhouettes that um, people are attracted to and also make sense in terms of the dynamics of the game it's also worth knowing that team fortress 2 has no female characters except for maybe pyro who may or may not be female or may or may not be human for that matter the second thing i would say and again i mentioned this in the episode it's not just about picking the right silhouettes it's what those silhouettes communicate to the player so the different shapes of the silhouettes communicate different things um so one of the big problems in games is that female characters in terms of the silhouettes that are chosen that they don't um portray power for example um they sort of portray it'll be like lanky or something like that but they don't communicate the same kind of like bulky power um, in those game systems anyway yeah it's a really really good point um i think the designers are really really smart people i'm sure they can figure out a way to create really memorable silhouettes and allow for um scope and diversity which i think is really really important Thank you.